The Bible says in James 1.8 that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Paraphrase, that means that the loyalty of a double-minded person is divided between God and the world and they're unstable in everything they do according to God because their loyalty is divided. So God is, he says he rejects the prayers of a double-minded person. So what does it mean to be double-minded? A double mind is having in your mind opposite or opposing views at different times. To be double-minded is the same as having a double heart. Double-mindedness is a sickness of the heart or the inner man, and it cannot be corrected in any medical way. It is a disease of the heart that needs to be identified quickly and corrected because double-mindedness, like any other disease, has symptoms. And the main symptom of this is instability, which is what James describes in um, verse 6 as one who is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed to and fro to be double-minded is to be inconsistent vacillating to be and act one way today be another way tomorrow just no consistency and when a life is unstable in the mind it's unsettled and it lacks solid convictions a person with a double mind lives by a double standard they're two-faced they're double-tongued they speak out both sides of their mouth, they're deceitful, and they are treacherous, according to the word. People who are double-minded are not sought after by God for service in any capacity because they are not faithful and they cannot be trusted. And you cannot put confidence in a double-minded man or woman. Confidence in an unfaithful man or woman in a time of trouble, according to Proverbs 25:19 is like a broken tooth or a foot that's out of joint. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And double-mindedness can simply mean to be undecided. You haven't made solid decisions. And the process of making decisions isn't a sin, but a permanent state of indecision is sinful. We make many decisions every day, but faith-based decisions must obey God's word, which exists to protect our hearts and help us thrive in his will for our lives. And the necessary sacrifice to obey God's truth fights against what we feel like doing. It consistently fights against our feelings. And so many people, when we talk to them, say, I feel this, I feel like this, I feel this, I feel like this. That is double-mindedness because the truth fights against your feelings and you cannot go by your feelings. You have to go by the truth of God's word. We fail to trust what God has waiting for us on the other side of obedience. And we phone almost every other source, whether it be a friend, a therapist, I'm not against therapists or friends, but we need to consult the creator of the universe to make these decisions. And this is double-mindedness when we go to every other source but him. And wavering too long is going to lead to hypocrisy. Doubt, as James recorded, fuels double-mindedness. To call into question the truth of, to be uncertain, to lack confidence, distrust, and to consider unlikely, these are all definitions of doubt, as, in, as is fear. Christians are to be united with Christ and be like-minded. We cannot have the minds of Christ and serve the world at the same time. Um, Dan Delzell wrote for the Christian Post and he wrote, a double-minded life will circumvent much of the good that the Holy Spirit wants to work in and through you. So basically double-mindedness is going to cost you the work of the Holy Spirit. Double-mindedness was a problem with the early Christians because James had to address it. And he says double-minded is one of, it, it's actually one of the key words of his epistle. It implies half-hearted allegiance, an attempt to combine the service of God with the service of self and the world. We're beginning to have a double mind when our faith begins to waver and when we begin to doubt God. 
and we start to rely on our own best thinking, our own best ideas. We go to conferences, we listen to podcasts, and we hear other leaders in ministries saying, do this, do that. We start to rely on the thinkers instead of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon in the Bible is the name given to material wealth. We are either of a double mind or a single mind. We are commanded to be and should strive for singleness of heart or mind. There is a lot of scripture to back that up. And only when we have a single mind or a heart in service for God, that is when we seek God with our whole heart and our whole being. And I have found from having been very double-minded for a lot of my life, not even recognizing that because nobody ever taught me about double-mindedness. It was just brought up in our company a few times the last week and I'm like, I'm gonna do a teaching on double-mindedness. Um, so I was very double-minded and I didn't even know it because no one addressed it. Um, but I always followed what I was told to do to be this role or to be um, right with God this way, this is the best way, people ahead of us have done this, that, and the other thing, this is the right way. But when God called me out into the field and told me to shed every skin that I had ever been given in the religious community, I am still struggling through this because everything that God's doing in our midst, people actually chastise us for. We aren't even, we don't bring any of this on, but what God is doing in our midst, we have not been taught, we have not seen this. And if I were to try to approach how to handle these things with all the things I've been taught about ministry, I would abandon these people that are crying out for help. I would abandon them. I would lock them up in a psych ward and say, that's the solution for you. So sadly, I spent many years double-minded and now when we operate single-mindedly here and we just wait on the Holy Spirit, we are having an entirely different experience. To be double-minded and not single-hearted or whole-hearted for God is sin. God says it. It is sin against him. And James tells the Christians who are double-minded to purify your hearts, you double-minded. And double-minded is described as carnality or worldliness. When Christians are trying to please God and still fit in with the world at the same time, they're double-minded and they're sinning against God. Their loyalty or allegiance is neither with the world or with God. And only when Christians seek and serve God in single-mindedness of singleness of mind and with all their hearts are they seeking and serving in sincerity. Anything short of that is sin against God. I'm going to um, use some teaching from Meg Butcher of Crosswalk.com. She had some very good points. Eight warning signs of a double-minded Christian. One, the content of your prayers. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. First John 5, 14. Prayer is our, that's our line to God. And Jesus died to make a way for us to approach our Father in heaven with his death on the cross. And when we pray to God, do we really believe that we are heard? It's possible to fall into a rhythm of praying half-heartedly, not believing God hears our prayers, and sometimes that he probably won't answer them. We just pray in this doubt in our daily prayers. If we continue to pray without faith, with just like I'm going to throw as much as I can against the wall and hope some sticks type of mindset, that is sin. It leads to double-mindedness. Number two, a sign of being double-minded is self-centered motivation. Do nothing out of selfish gain or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others over yourselves. Not looking to your own self-interest, but each of you to be, the, but each of you to the interests of others. Philippians two, three through four. 
The human heart defaults easily to manipulation and selfish intentions. And following Jesus requires humble hearts that seek to serve others. We can run our plans and actions through the filter of Paul's words to the Philippians and prayerfully ask God to expose anything selfish from the motives that are in our lives. It's not always obvious, especially when our plans align with what the world encourages as acceptable Christian behavior, ministry building. But when you ask God to sift it, and you can humble yourself and let God really sift it, you'd be shocked and amazed like I would at how much of mine was self-service. Most of what you glean from the world's best advice opposes the Holy Spirit. Number three, our speech. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Proverbs 16, 23 and 24. Double-mindedness says one thing, but it does another. And the Bible is clear about our need to watch what comes out of our mouths. Not just eliminating profanity and bad words, but talking in a way that makes people feel bad. Our words are powerful and can either reflect our love of Christ or pull a rug out from under someone. I, we deal with people and most of them are hurting and so much of the damage that is really hard to repair is from things people have said to other people. I think that people can get punched in the face and feel less of a burn than the painful words that come to them from people they respect and want love from. That is the stuff that really cripples a life. And I've heard from many that are suicidal that the last straw for them was something someone said to them at a moment they couldn't take it. They just couldn't take it. And some have ended their lives. And I often think, God help us never to be that person that flippantly passes judgment or says something just because you can, and it might even be true, that causes another person to lose all hope and want to end their life. There will be a price for that. None of us have a right to do that. Gossip, criticism, even negative self-talk and condemnation are not a reflection of who God says we are, nor does this kind of speech reflect his purpose for our lives. So we can talk about other people and destroy them with our words, but if we talk about ourselves in the same manner, we are destroying the call that God has on our life as well. So it's just as damaging you are just as destructive. You have no right to talk about yourself the way that you are, um, that you feel. You cannot say what you feel because God created you and you're condemning his work. You're condemning what he made. So that does anger him. It's never the action alone or a specific set of vocabulary that he's concerned about, but rather the heart behind our choices in our words. He knows our heart and the underlying intention of the things we choose to say. And any time that you use those words to harshly say something about another or about yourself, you're actually judging God. Number four, the company we keep or don't keep. In Galatians 2.12, it says, For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Our fellowship can mirror our double-mindedness, wrote James. Do wealthy people rece receive special treatment in your company? People that are more popular, that could get you something? Is there a group of people in your life that you immediately treat better than others. That is sin. In some congregations in James' day, the rich were given more respect and better seats than the poor. And as a result, James scolded congregations not to show partiality amongst themselves by having people's significance follow some ranking by wealth or status. James was aware of the problems that result from this hypocritical two-faced fellowship. He condemned it because he was indirectly involved in a conflict at that time between Paul and Peter that were both apostles of that day. Peter showed partiality and fellowship when certain men came from James. These verses show that Peter was as subject to human weakness as the rest of us. 
And in this instance, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when the Jewish believers sent from James came, he would withdraw, separate himself from the Gentiles, fearing those who were of the circumcision. In biblical times, there was also cliques, there was prejudices, discrimination, ostracizing others, all of the injustices that we still see today. And in the verses above, Peter was embarrassed to be sitting with the Gentiles when the Jews showed up. The company we keep or choose not to keep says a lot about the status of our double-mindedness. Are there groups of people that you will not be seen with, that you feel you're too good for, that you don't want the reputation of being seen with those people, you don't want to risk the talk that will happen, you don't want to be out sinning with people, but if you're casting people according to value based on your opinion of them, you're making a very big mistake against the kingdom. God places people in our lives purposely, very purposefully. We exist in our families and communities to look around and love all of those within our reach because God says they will know us by our love, not by our judgment, not by us sorting out who's sinning and who's not sinning because sinners sin. That's what they do. They sin. There's rules around Christians that sin, but sinners sin, and God commands us to love them. He commands us to treat them honorably, with respect, not to condemn them, because there's no way to draw them into the kingdom if we're rejecting them and passing judgment on them. We are not going to win them. Five, disobedience. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Double-minded Christians that say they love the Lord, it's frightening to think that they can, we can really feel that we love him with all of our hearts, but we do not reflect that love in the way that we live our lives. It's a complete sham. It's heartbreaking to think that when we are pulled to any shred of double-mindedness, we're not loving the God the way that we say we do, the way we intend to, or the way we were made to. God equipped us to love him single-mindedly. And to love God is to obey God, period. Not in a legalistic fashion, but in a heartfelt way that trusts his will in our lives completely. So that means like when you go into a marriage, and you trust that marriage to be safe for you and you don't set out to dishonor your spouse, that is the same love that we are equipped to love God with. If we don't, that's a choice. The Bible makes it clear that if we love the Lord, we will keep his commandments and we will want to keep his commandments. And this means following what the Bible tells us to do entirely not the parts we like entirely number six sign of being double-minded is we don't do what we say we will do james 2 20 says you foolish person do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless useless james is passionate about our obedience to the lord but he's not legalistic and he's not rule following he's not about making checklists god looks at our heart he wants us to wholeheartedly obey him because we recognize his love for us and desire it to be a reciprocal relationship. But that being said, faith without deeds is useless. When we love God, know Jesus, and follow faithfully, not perfectly, but faithfully, the evidential deeds, that means we are obedient in the way that we love people placed in our lives because in the end, only people matter. The rest of this is going to burn up. Only people matter, and we're commanded to love them. And the evidence of how we love God is in how we love people that are around us, that God has put as part of our everyday lives. And there is no test when you have isolated yourself within the Christian community and you aren't out mixing with the world at all. There's no test there. There's no stretching there. There's no proof of anything there. And that is not what he's called us to. I often hear that from people, they say, God knows my heart. And if I ever hear people say that, they're defending some behavior that they have. Otherwise, there's no reason they even say that. They would not have to say that if they weren't trying to defend something that the Holy Spirit's already convicted them on. On Judgment Day, 
all hearts are going to be exposed as selfish and wicked, all of them. God has said that. There's nothing in us that isn't filthy. Only Jesus is what's good about us. So no one has a shred of good in their heart. And the only good God sees in us is what is done in obedience to Jesus Christ. So don't ever fall for the lie that God sees my heart. He does see your heart, but he has a completely different version of what it is. And that is not that there's anything good in it. That statement alone is so rebellious and prideful. It is something that is completely from the enemy and it, it actually works more often than many other lies that he has perpetrated. Number seven, evidence of being double-minded is our priorities or the lack thereof. Isaiah 45, five says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. And God has made it very clear throughout the Bible that he is to come first. And trying to live without placing God first, according to this author, is like walking around with your underwear on the outside of your clothes. Something everyone can see is clearly off if you're calling yourself a believer. For Christ followers, it would, it would not be, it's just as obvious if you say that you're a Christian to God as they used in this example, that if our lives are genuinely prioritized right, they're going to show up that way in our conduct. And how can we be prepared to walk out in the world without letting God prepare our hearts each day? We literally have to put him on first. And reverting thoughts to him in prayer and seeking him in his word each day, our heart is where our time is. Our heart is where our money goes. So if you look at where your time and where your money goes, that's where your heart is. You can say all day long, God is first in your life but look at where your time goes and look at where your money goes. That is truly where your heart is. Mm -hmm. And for most people, sadly, it's a, it's a bunch of different things, but it shows that self-gratification is where your heart is. Your heart is pleasing self. That aligns with Satan. So sadly, many people, that's why he, the Bible says, Lord, Lord, and he says, I never knew you because by your actions, your time and your funding, your finances, you showed God was not first. Because if God was first, you would be serving others. You'd be out gathering people into his kingdom. You would be building the family of God. You would be serving them. And if you're not, the evidence is against you. The evidence that God will use in the end to judge you is against you. Number eight, evidence that you're double-minded is impatience. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit for anger resides in the lap of fools. And it's hard to express our trust in God when we're losing our patience. We lose our patience with people in our lives in situations that God has asked us to wait. Many people, God is, has us waiting. I have never had to wait so much in my life as when I have decided to really follow Jesus and decide I'm going to wait for what he has rather than what my norm was, which is, okay, we're just going to go do this because I don't know what else to do. And we're not going to sit here and do nothing. So we go ahead and do this other thing. And then we end up in this whole different place. Waiting is not easy, especially for someone like me. But I have learned that not waiting on God takes us to a place where it takes forever to get back to where we would have been had we just waited. He's teaching us something that we don't want to learn, and that is how to wait. Patience is a virtue, and we're supposed to be watering it in our lives, and patience with ourselves so we don't fall into legalistic faith, to pretend we're people we're not even to God himself. He loves us as we are messed up and broken. He asks us to be faithful and patient and he daily wants to sanctify our hearts. So this fakeness that people put on is offensive to God. 
How can Christians guard their hearts from double-mindedness? God says in John 15, 4, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. There's a big problem when you look out in the faith community and it's all separate camps. They're all different, territorial, divided. Sometimes even camps are divided within themselves. I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit would produce unity. The true Spirit of God is a unifying spirit of the family of God. So if your camp is divided from the body of Christ, or you are territorial, or you are better than, different than, withholding from, that you are a separate silo compared to this group, somehow you're separated from the body of Christ, you better really examine the foundation of what you're serving because the Holy Spirit is one body. And he says we all need each other. And if you are truly gonna honor God and follow him in ministry, you're going to network and connect with as many different ones as you can. You're going to build up the others any way you can. You're going to exalt Jesus it is not about you. It is not about your ministry. It is not about a denomination. It is about building one family because if you're going to heaven, everyone's together in one place. There is no division or separation. Double-mindedness can affect multiple areas of our lives. Our thoughts spill into our conscious minds unhindered, but through the power of God living in every believer, we have an ability to filter them and to hold fast to the truth. That's why it's very important to know the truth. We've had several around here tonight that have asked for those audio Bibles because most of us can't live without them. We have audio Bibles playing in all of our houses. Many of the women have them playing in their rooms. We have one playing up in the hallway right now. I can hear it. We ha I have one in my bedroom that plays 24 seven, uh, every layer of the house. Um, if you want to make it incredibly hard for the enemy to stir up drama and trouble in your midst, play the Bible out loud. Bible.is, version. they have a, a audio way to play on those free apps on your phone. If you don't wanna go buy a Wonder Bible like we buy, then you can um, play those apps on your phone and just play the Bible. Because that reads your mind, it heals your mind, it also sorts your mind and it puts the truth in your mind so that you have something to draw from, it's doing a lot more for you than you could ever imagine. And it also calms you. It helps me not have terrible sleep, keeps me from having ridiculous nightmares. It calms anxiety. It is great for the mental health. I would say having the audio Bible playing is by far more powerful and effective than any medication you could take for your mental health. It is by far more powerful and more effective. So I would say play the word out loud around you as much as you can because the effect of that is going to shock you in a very short amount of time. Through the power of God living in every believer, we have the ability to filter the truth. And so if you have it speaking to you, it's amazing, the effect of that. Based on our free will that God designed us with, we have the ability to make decisions, but if you've got the word in your mind, you can check those choices quickly. The time will, or the word in you will filter and catch things and red flag them that normally you wouldn't even, you're so used to doing them, but the presence of the word in you is going to cause these things to light up and you will go oh nope not doing it destroying is what we're called to do speculations meaning decisions based on free will destroying in the original greek text means to demolish with great force to tear down the lies in our minds we must abide in christ the holy spirit in us because of jesus helps us to decipher truth from lies and the only way you can do that is with the word 
As we abide in Christ, we grow to love and understand God more. And if you are not growing in love, you are not growing in God. There's nothing about becoming smarter or knowing more about the Bible. If you are not growing in love, you are not growing in God. Our hearts slowly and steadily change to mirror his, and we get to know our Father in heaven personally. So um, the one thing we have constantly tried to do, seven bells as it's called, um, was intended to be a prayer ministry, but then because we ended up, <laughs> we've gone all these different ways out of just our love for these women, but we're always trying to get back to prayer ministry because we know that's what God called us to and what he's still calling us to is prayer ministry. It was that, it is that, it's always been that, but we keep getting pulled into saving lives because we love them so much. Fortunately, there's other people now that are catching up to that need, so we're able to pull away from that a little bit. But um, prayer ministry is our passion and our purpose, and so we are, um, we are looking forward to a day coming very soon where we can focus completely on that and breaking down all of the lies in a person's mind and heart is the focus of what we're supposed to be doing. So helping people sift through and determine the structure of the enemy that is set up through lies and agreements, that is what we're purposed to do. So when he has set up this structure through the course of your life and whatever it was you've been taught, it has to be torn down. And I say even recently he's had to tear mine back down and rebuild according to the Holy Spirit because I had a great deal of mine built according to religion. So he's building me up in the spirit and it has taught me completely a different way of doing prayer ministry than what I have learned. So I am really grateful to have been brought into this season of my life as much as it was the most painful, it has been the most rewarding and we look forward to being able to serve our community in that way, just from what we've learned and what we've experienced in our own lives, being able to tear down by using the authority we have learned to use the plans and the works of the enemy. So what happens when we're caught being double-minded? James 4, 8 says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's easy to fall into the black hole of sin and temptation that you came out of. Jesus does not expect perfection. He died for us because we are far from perfect. We can't avoid sin, but we do need to humble ourselves before God and ask for forgiveness from him and from others. Repentance is the way we show we are sorry. Repentance isn't just saying I'm sorry. Repentance is a turn, a complete turn from that behavior. True repentance requires to agree with God that sin is sin and to abandon it. Otherwise, repentance has not happened. If you're still walking with that sin, you have not repented. And you need to repent to be saved. So if you're still walking in sin, you cannot call yourself. The, the salvation happens when you turn from sin, when you repent from sin and then the result of that is that you will turn from sin. I want to clarify that turning from sin does require repentance to be saved because some people can just suddenly stop doing things, but that does not equal saved. So you have to repent before God. The effort to learn and grow is as important as the words, I'm sorry, but we can easily slide back if we are not willing to walk through a change of heart. That part is critically needed. We can come near to God when we have sinned. Jesus made a way for us to come right to him. And when we come to him with our wrong choices and our sinful ways, he is very faithful to forgive us, guide us, grow us. And this is how we move from double-minded faith to mature faith. I was just talking today with one of the ladies. There's something that happened, and um, there was a, an incident over a few days where um, in the community there were some people that were really wounded by this behavior. And when this person was finally confronted, they blamed 
others for their behavior. They said, well, because of this, this, and this that other people had done, this is why I did this. And it only upset them even more. And the, at the beginning, they were very willing to work with this person and um, resolve this and keep the community intact. But because this person just kept firing blame at them, they decided, forget it, we're done. And they put her out. And so then at that point, a few hours later, she decided, well, maybe I should take responsibility for my behavior. And at that point, she tried to shift gears and say, I'm really sorry. I was the one responsible for my choices. So I don't know how they're going to sort that out. But I, when I was talking to the person here that I was just sharing that with because we are standing on the side watching them, um, I said, you know, if people could just understand that when they fall into something, if they would just rise up and own it and say, I'm sorry, I did that and not blame 20 things going on around them or even one thing around them. It's so amazing how fast people want to be merciful, to come around them, to lift them up. It doesn't even matter how bad the behavior was. They just are so eager, especially in this community to help. Like, how can I help you? What can I do for you? when something really bad has happened, poor choices, and it's made a really big mess. But what really postures people against each other is when the person who's guilty says, it's your fault, I did this. That really makes them take their hands off and say, we don't want any part of this, we don't want this here. So the best thing to do for God and man <laughs> is to just take ownership of your behavior, because that's going to bring about the mercy of God and it brings about the mercy of your peers and man in most cases. A follower of Jesus should feel happy after reading God's word, but reading the Bible is should not be a means to an end to becoming Christ-like. We need to go beyond that. We aren't looking for a good feeling. We're not trying to come into faith for anything about feelings at all or striving to be good, or striving to be in ministry, or striving to something, prove something to someone that we can change and be a good person. It can't be about that. A pleasant, satisfied feeling can deceive us into thinking we've accomplished something that is actually not true, and it hasn't happened. Luke 11 tells the story of a woman so moved by the words and miracles of Jesus Christ that she exclaimed, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. And Jesus responded to her, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. He talked about unwise people whose lives were not built on the rock. Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them is foolish, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 24 to 26. So those who want to obey Christ will do what he says. Although no one can earn salvation by what he does, and we can lose our salvation by being hearers only. There has to be fruit. Luke, the parable of the sower is very clear about that, that many rise up, but they fall away from temptation or a variety of other reasons. It does not grow into salvation. In summary, a double-minded person is one who says one thing and does another, simply. They claim to know God, yet their actions do not live up to such claims. It does not look like a bride and a bridegroom in relationship. He thinks about two things, two different things at the same time and can't make up his mind about anything. They're dually focused and have split opinions on the same, depending on whose company they're in. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world and they're unstable in all they do. They are different in church than they are at home or with their friends. That's a double-minded person. They have no consistency between who they are when they're talking to their pastor and who they are when they're talking to their spouse at home. They're two totally different people. That's double-minded. It is God who promises to forgive all of our sins and heal all of our diseases, but only if we do it his way by his standards and not by man's way or man's standards. So abide in Jesus Christ humbly surrender and submit to him daily in everything, pursuing righteousness, 
praying unceasingly by covering yourself with the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to come to God in complete faith without doubting and wavering because you don't want people coming to you like that. You don't want people coming to you and you say to them, I love you, I'm going to care for you today. And they go, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I don't believe you well. I don't trust you and I don't believe you. We wouldn't like that either. God will reject our prayers if we are insincere and double-minded. He's offended. We would be offended. Our conversation, our speech speaks to our spiritual maturity or lack thereof. So watch your mouth and you'll see how mature you are or aren't. Before examining the words that flow from your mouth, you should examine the thoughts in your mind and your heart first. For Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12, 34. You can listen to someone when they're with their friends and you are going to know exactly who they are. I used to tell both men and women, if you're going to date someone and you want it to be serious, go spy on them when they're with their closest friends and you'll see exactly who they are. Don't believe what comes out of their mouth. Go watch them with their closest friends and you'll see who they are. We cannot always control what we hear, but we can control what we hold dear in our hearts. And each day, Satan, the prince of the power of the air, relentlessly inspires a multitude of improper thoughts, and we must take them captive to the obedience of Christ. We should pray without doubting, read God's word with great care, fellowship without bias, treat everyone equally, have faith while consistently keeping God's law, and speak kind words to everyone. Be kind. With single-minded attention to God's will as shown in his word, we are going to draw near to God and he is going to draw near to us. Precious Lord, please help us. Help us not to be fake people. Help us not to have any fake side to us at all that we will risk being exposed. Help us to walk in complete sincerity before you and man and help us above all to focus only on loving you, loving others, and following and obeying the truth of the Holy Spirit. I ask you to work miraculously in every life that hears this. Raise up an army, God. Help us to do this right for you and for others that you intend to bring to heaven for eternity. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.